the low place where the running waters gathered. Frogtown has always been and continues to be the low place where people gather from the four directions. Red people from the north, white people from the east, brown and black people from the south, the yellow people from the west, at different times from different places for many different reasons the people have come to this the center of the continent here beside the heartland's great aorta the mississippi river seven generations have grown old with the people of other races will seven more do the same frog town is the city in the shadow of minnesota's capital Frog Town is the heart in St. Paul. As the white Europeans step their heels on the back of this continent, the Ojibwe, or Anishinaabe, moved west into northern Minnesota. In the 1740s, armed with European firearms, they battled the Dakota at the center of the Dakota world. From the sacred lake, now Mille Lacs Lake, the wide round eye of Minnesota, the Dakota, whose numbers were fewer, moved to the confluence area of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. From there, they spread their camps along the rivers, and the closest campsite to our frog town was at the Phelan Creek area, eight miles down the Mississippi one and a half miles southeast of the current state capital. On September 22nd, 1805, while exploring the Mississippi, Zebulon Pike bought a strip of land of 100,000 acres and on either side of the river from St. Anthony Falls to the Mississippi, Minnesota confluence, Pike paid the Dakota $200 in trade goods and 60 gallons of whiskey. According to a Dakota version, they sold him only two square miles here at the mouth of the Minnesota River. The U.S. government built Fort Snelling at the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. With a military presence in the area, White traders and moneyed interests wanted the Dakota lands. On September 29, 1837, the Medwakantan Dakota signed a treaty selling all their land east of the Mississippi for payments in 20-year annuities. Immediately, the French Canadians, the white traders, the whiskey merchants, and the Teamsters moved from Fort Snelling to where St. Paul would rise. Among them was a somewhat unscrupulous man, Joseph Rondo, who built his home near a tamarack swamp where Sears Department Store sits today. Blacksmith Antoine Pepin, his Indian wife and large family, settled near Rondo where today's busy Rice Street and University Avenue intersect. Pepin's daughter, Marguerite, was the first child baptized in the small log church of Father Lucien Galtier in 1840. During the 1840s, white men were still fighting with Mexico for Texas. The Texans asked the United States government for help, and eventually, the U.S. invaded Mexico. To recruit and keep soldiers, a law passed so that any soldier who re-enlisted received one quarter section of land as a bonus. The Military Bounty Land Act used land taken from the Indians by questionable means to pay white soldiers to invade Mexico. On August 17, 1848, Private John Sullivan of the Virginia Volunteers received his quarter section. 
Meanwhile, near Antoine Pepin's blacksmith shop, another French Canadian, Oliver Saint Martin, used Joseph Rondo as a character witness and filed for ownership of a quarter section of government land. Saint Martin took legal ownership from Sullivan August 18, 1848, the day after Sullivan received the land in Virginia. The sale is actually a post-dated paper shuffle. That quarter section is now the center of Frog Town, bounded by University Avenue on the south, Dale Street on the west, Minnehaha at the north, and Western Avenue at the east. The French Canadians were quick to settle the farmsteads. In 1850, 139 people lived on 18 homesteads nearby. 11 men were farmers, 18 were laborers, and two were teamsters. Of their wives, six were Indians who had taken French names. Of the 139 people, 122 had French Canadian names. 1851, one Ambrose Pierce built a log cabin near Antoine Pepin's home. And in 1931, when University Avenue was widened, the walls of Pierce's log home were found in a house at 153 University. In the 1840s and the 1850s, land speculators such as the territorial representative Henry Rice and the professed Indian hater and governor Alexander Ramsey gobbled up the treaty land. Ramsey at one time owned the land adjacent and west of San Martin. The land speculators became extremely wealthy. At some time before 1860, the French Canadians began to move further north, leaving the growing city to the merchant class and their laborers. An 1869 city directory indicates that the St. Paul and Pacific Railroad mapped out shops just north of the city limits. James J. Hill bought the St. Paul and Pacific July 14th, 1879, and he purchased the shop area in 1881. These shops the Jackson shops were built in 1881 and 1882 and were at the hub of Hill's Great Northern Railroad Empire. The urban frog town was actually built around Hill's Railroad. When Hill purchased the St. Paul and Pacific, he changed the name to the St. Paul, Minneapolis and Manitoba, and eventually to the Great Northern Railway. To get construction help, Railroads advertised in many East European newspapers, and immigrants flooded St. Paul. From Austria, Hungary, Germany, and Poland, they came to lay track, build rail cars, work the machinery in the roundhouse. With them came their churches. On November 20th, 1881, the first Polish Catholic church St. Adalbert's was dedicated. In 1885, a Presbyterian church was built at Edmund and Farrington. A general store appeared at Rice and Bianca, now Como, in 1880. In 1877, a German cooper, Dahlem Nicholas Wagner, built his house on Western Avenue, but in 1885, he moved the house around the corner to build a grocery store. The house still stands on Charles. In 1887, the Church of St. Agnes was founded for the German Catholics who lived where the French Canadian Saint Martin had his fields. The St. Agnes steeple, built after the turn of the century, is still the visual landmark of Frog Town. St. Paul's population grew quickly, and as usual, 
Frogtown housed its working people. The wealthy lived a couple miles south, and when their favorite racetrack closed, they prevailed on the city council for an ordinance to allow a roadway for light driving on University Avenue, their euphemism for a racetrack. The St. Paul Driving Club built the one mile straightaway on the avenue from Dale Street to Lexington. The club even provided a private police force for security. On October 8, 1884, the track opened with a parade of the finest carriages and the sleekest horses prancing within the enclosed 40-foot wide mile long track. Due to the lateness of the season, no races were run. The following February, Ramsey County donated a site for the new state fair, and a permanent oval racetrack was built on Snelling Avenue in Falcon Heights. The University Avenue racetrack was dismantled without a race ever run. As life in St. Paul sped up, so did the work in Frogtown. In 1887, sewers were laid. In 1889, trolley rails were put down on University Avenue. The Lowry Streetcar Company opened the University Line December 9, 1890, thereby connecting St. Paul and Minneapolis. On May 7, 1895, an even more boisterous event had 3,000 baseball fans cheering the first game in the new Aurora Park off University and Dale. Two weeks into the season, neighbors obtained a court injunction to stop Sunday baseball, which disturbed their neighborhood's quietude. The owner of the St. Paul Baseball Club, Charlie Comiskey, tried to avoid the injunction, but the city prevailed. Then Comiskey encouraged construction of another park just outside the city limits where ordinances did not apply. The team moved into that park for the 1897 season. However, when the city extended its city limits, Comiskey took his club to Chicago after the 1899 season where he formed the Chicago White Sox. Lexington Park became the home of the St. Paul Saints, a successful AAA minor league team for many years. And that park became the home of some interesting spectator events, such as the 1908 International Balloon Race. On July 18th, a Twin Cities theater figure promoted this race at Lexington Park. The balloon, America, lifted first and won the race. The British entry, the King Edward, just behind it, finished second. During the Civil War and the Dakota Indian Uprising, or Little Crow's War, Colonel Henry Sibley put out a call for laborers to free up the soldiers for duty against the starving, rebelling Indians. Groups of free blacks and former slaves arrived for that work, and among them was Robert Hickman, who came to St. Paul with a contingency of about 30 blacks, some of whom moved just north of Frogtown and east of Lake Como. In 1863, Copperheads, or white sympathizers with the South, ousted a Sunday school teacher for allowing two black children in his class. The racial strife, created and inflamed by the likes of Ramsey and Sibley, now affected the blacks as well as the Indians. In November of 1863, Hickman began his own church, Pilgrim Church, and later, in 1928, Pilgrim Baptist Church was built here on Central, just south of University Avenue. With a community of blacks developing in St. Paul, opportunities continued. In 1889, 
a strikingly strong 28-year-old black lawyer arrived from Chicago. Frederick McGee was the first black admitted to the Minnesota bar. McGee and his family lived in a stately home at 665 University, where the Western State Bank stands today. He helped found the National Niagara Movement for political and civil rights. In 1912, he laid the groundwork for the founding of the St. Paul branch of the NAACP, but he died before the charter was signed. From this branch came Roy Wilkins, the eventual head of the United States NAACP. With the turn of the century, Frogtown became an even busier center of activity. Construction of major city and state landmarks blossomed in Frogtown. From the architectural plan of Cass Gilbert rose the white marble state capitol. The Church of St. Agnes was built in the finest European tradition. At Dale and Minnehaha, the Great Northern Railroad built the nation's most modern rail yard over former swampland. Small churches and businesses popped up like urban flowers. Many of them where their successors still stand. By this time, Frogtown's identity came from the Germans who had replaced the French Canadians. In fact, the German immigrants named the area Froschenberg or Frogtown in the dubious remembrance of their French predecessors. Each night when the German rail workers returned from the rail yards, their children would line up at the taverns and shag the can for beer or pretzels. Yet in July of 1922, that all changed. A nationwide railroad strike affected Frogtown's Great Northern shops. When the union wouldn't capitulate, the railroad rolled in non-union workers, scabs from the eastern states who lived in rail cars behind the shops. The bitter strike lasted until January 1923, and many men who had struck were never called back to work. Frogtown still remains in St. Paul, but the railroads have gone. One of the favorite taverns of railroad men still stands at McCubbin and Blair. The nickel joint has always been a working man's bar, and its back room is a museum of athletic memorabilia. Frogtown athletes have been among the nation's best. In the 1930s, Larry Rosenthal went to play eight years in the American League with the White Sox, the Indians, and the Yankees. In the 1920s, a young ice skater performed between periods at the State Fair Hippodrome hockey games. Later, the young man, Eddie Shipstead, teamed with Oscar Johnson and practiced routines on Lake Como. With brother Roy Shipstead, the three men created the Shipstead and Johnson ice follies in the mid-1930s. Their ice show has since become Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom on Ice. By the 1940s, University Avenue had been long established as the automobile business strip. This main artery between Minneapolis and St. Paul thrived. But in 1962, when the state of Minnesota built Interstate 94 through the heart of the black neighborhood, just a half mile south of University Avenue, the street link between the cities was broken. Business life faltered. The fabric of two neighborhoods was torn. The trolleys had been removed in the mid-50s. Now those who could afford it moved to the suburbs. The poorer neighbors watched their neighborhoods slowly crumble. In the late 1960s and the early 1970s, 
American Indian activists reintroduced the consciousness of Indian and white Americans to Native American heritages. In April of 1972, the Red Schoolhouse opened as the first American Indian survival school. In 1974, while Dennis Banks and Russell Means stood trial and were acquitted in St. Paul for their involvement at Wounded Knee, South Dakota, the American Indian movement marched to a vacant Catholic school, St. Vincent's, in Frogtown. They claimed the building for their school. After the school had been established in Frogtown, more Native American Indians moved to live here. In the later 1970s, Southeast Asians emigrated from Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, where they had fought beside American soldiers and agents. They moved to Frogtown and put their unique cultural stamps among those of the other races here. In December 1977, Father Peter Tan, a Vietnamese, arrived at St. Vincent's Church and organized the first Vietnamese Catholic congregation in Minnesota. Shortly thereafter, Christ Lutheran Church, across from the state capitol, started its Southeast Asian ministry. By 1980, Frogtown had become the most heterogeneous community in St. Paul, and it was the poorest. Once again, Frogtown had become the low place where people gathered, working people who did not control the train yards, the streetcars, or the placement of the interstate. Whether blacks displaced by the interstate or the gentrification of their community, whether Asians torn loose from their homelands by a war, whether American Indians from northern Minnesota, or whites whose European grandparents worked the railroads, Frogtown took them, the low place, where the nutrients of life come together, where mingling people produce life and spirit. Frogtown, the low place, where life gathers, begins again to create the moisture and the richness of culture, the faces, the voices, and the future.